Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, the people always have to lead and thank you. That was wonderful. Um, I want to quickly check in because I we also have to make sure we're doing okay for time. Um, is there any like other comments I want to be like quickly said around before I kind of move on to the last question about the present? Um, anything? Yeah. Okay, cool. So the last question that I will do before we discuss the future and this one um, is for Sabine is why have anti-imperialists in the United States disregarded the ongoing genocide and war in Tigray um, committed by the Ethiopian state alongside its actors in the name of anti-imperialism? And yeah, if you could just keep this one semi-brief uh, and we'll move on to the future afterwards. All right, I, I, I will keep it very brief. And uh, if you allow me, I might also jump a little bit into the future with the question um, in answering the question. Uh, I think that's a very interesting question, yeah, because um, it actually combines um, two really contradictory sets. For one, uh, we find Eritrea as this kind of um, beacon for a lot of anti-imperialist um, thinkers and activists. Um, they want to kind of have another, like f find another sovereign state that kind of uh, can embody um, this anti-imperialist stance in the contemporary present, yeah? Because Eritrea, uh, maybe some don't know, but um, during the struggle for independence, one of its really um, vanguard policies was almost to say that they want to rely only on themselves and not on like the imperialist countries. And so what happened was that even those Eritreans that would go to the so-called diaspora to Sidet, um, they would feel a responsibility to economically repay um, and help the revolution that was being fought in Kassala and Sudan and in Eritrea and, and all these kind of fields that were the struggle. So you have this, um, um, yeah, ideology that is um, imbued in, in the um, independent in the struggle for independence in Eritrea for one and you find that outside in the outside world especially leftist movements that have supported this kind of struggle since the 70s onwards still kind of stuck in that time frame um, of Eritrea being this space um, or imaginary space on the other hand you have Ethiopia <laughs> this empire that has been since the 18th century um, also being imagined as this site of um, emancipation, even mentioned in the Bible, uh, well, princes shall, out, shall come out of Egypt, Ethiopia shall soon stretch at stretch out her hands unto God. Yeah, so you have even this kind of religious, spiritual movement, you see the Rastafari movement that have found their home, Zion in Ethiopia, uh, you find uh, W.E.B. Du Bois saying that Ethiopia is the site um, of um, suspension. Even Marcus Garvey, when he was looking for, you know, the big, back, uh, big black republic, he was also looking to Ethiopia. So you have, like, on one hand, this kind of rebellious um, movement that has become the site of anti-imperialism, which is Eritrea, since the 1990s. And you have Ethiopia as the site of uh, empire. Black empire that has never been colonized, that has averted colonialism um, with the Battle of Adwa in, um, in 1896. And so you find these kind of two, two countries that are so imbued in their own histories, entangled, that you can almost disentangle, but that incorporate really different visions for different people outside of Ethiopia and Eritrea. And, and so I think um, if you want to understand, and I don't I'm not saying that this is the only solution or proper reading of why certain people have been have been ignoring what's happened, what was happening in uh, Tigray, but it kind of allows us the the discomfort of um, anti-imperialist kind of thinkers and movers to to look at Ethiopia as the site that is actually um, committing all these um, atrocious atrocities and uh, human rights uh, violations, as well as Eritrea as this place that is um, basically asking its people to leave the country um, or to drown in the Mediterranean Sea, rather than to find uh, proper prospects in Eritrea. 
So I think there are some historical aspects that allow us to see the tensions that both uh, political entities inhabit and that um, have caused some problems for especially an African diaspora and that is not an Eritrean and Ethiopian diaspora but really an African diaspora to, to kind of see uh, the violence uh, the structural violence that is um, almost being made in the name of uh, imperialism in Ethiopia but also in the name of revolution in Eritrea. So these kind of blind spots that we have uh, when we kind of narrate history retroactively, uh, I think need to be really thoroughly like invoked by those people that are often marginalized in these processes. Um, I think I could say more, but I, I'll, I'll leave it at this and maybe we can get back to it uh, later. Yes, yeah, hopefully we, uh, we'll touch on that a little bit more in the future section. Um, but Alan, maybe, uh, did you want to offer a comment very briefly before we move on? Okay. Can you hear me? Yeah. All right. Thank you. Uh, so what, what I want to do is uh, try to capitalize on what Sabine said in response to the question of why anti-imperialist forces have abandoned the cause of Tigray. I think they have sacrificed Tigray on the altar of Ethiopia's uh, established symbolism for being a beacon of independence, especially after the uh, victory of Ethiopia in the battle against European colonialism, especially Italian colonialism in 1896 at Adwa. So uh, the thing about Adwa, so most, I mean, you know, we need to adapt a critical att attitude to Ethiopia's history, especially if in Adwa. Adwa was a war that was really, uh, its own rulers had a, had a role in, uh, in the causal uh, dynamics, in the mechanics of the war itself. The war is about, the war is about uh, one article of a treaty that Menelik signed with Italy. But in that treaty, it's about one article. It's the one provision at, at Article uh, 17. But uh, what, what's most surprising about that treaty is Article 3 gave away one entry. They gave away and established the Italian colony of Eritrea. So that treaty was, that treaty itself, and the bar, and the after, aftermath of the war itself is what really divided Ethiopia and gave us this colonial legacy of Italy. Uh, of Italy in Eritrea. So that's where the, the whole uh, idea of Italy, the rise of Italian nationalist uh, struggle in Ethiopia uh, starts, starts out. So, so, is that, so the context is the Berlin Conference, the, the scandal for Africa. So, so that gives us the context for, to talk about, to talk about uh, 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 colonialism. Uh, and also the context for the rise of uh, the uh, ideology of national self-determination by different uh, international groups. Uh, uh, the EPLF or the PFDJ being one, uh, the TPLF is another. Uh, so it can be traced back to that. So Ethiopia has earned a reputation for being a beacon of independence, and that has given rise uh, to this misconception uh, that Tigray is fighting a little nationalist war while Ethiopia is uh, fighting uh, a pan-Ethiopian uh, a uh, more superior form of uh, nationalist war. Thank you. Thank you, Alan Mayu. Uh, now to move on to um, discussing uh, the future in this context, the future in this region, and how, like, of course, that interpolates the past and the present. Um, and the first question um, is, how could we critically engage with regional politics from our location in the diaspora uh, without being insensitive to lived experiences of people in the region. And I'll offer this to Nisreen as well. Oh, oops, yeah, you're muted, sorry. Sorry about that. Um, yeah, I, uh, I don't have, I mean, I have a brief sort of comment on this. Um, and let me just, uh, sorry, if you just give me one minute, sorry about that. No worries. Okay, um, 
So yeah, I, I actually tend to think that we, um, I think this is a really important question. I think um, we in the diaspora have to sort of continuously ask ourselves this question. And I think the role of the diaspora in regional or national politics is often overstated from our vantage point, meaning I think we envision ourselves playing a larger and more significant role than we often should. Um, and I don't know how this plays out in, in Eritrea, Ethiopia, but uh, in the context of Sudan, I would say that elements of the diaspora are often more conservative and reformist than people on the ground, um, even if they're ostensibly fighting for uh, democracy or greater freedoms. So the first step to me is often uh, for us to take a step back and figure out how to let people in the region, um, so you know, and, and really the radical elements of the Sudanese revolution in this context, um, that are organized, whether as resistance committees, unions, youth and feminist groups, that we let those groups decide what, what role they would like the diaspora to play and on what terms. Um, I think we have a tendency to often want to gather and send money, for example, to resolve a particular problem. And I've often heard uh, particularly youth organizers say that taking money from the diaspora and from international nonprofits can create its own uh, kind of set of problems. So I've seen, for example, members of Girifna, which is a youth movement that I was affiliated with for a while, refuse money from several US-based nonprofits precisely because they knew that this could have a de-radicalizing or at least a depoliticizing effect on the work that they wanna do. And so letting people on the ground who are organized around a vision for a more just future for everyone, both analyze and define the role they want us to play, I think is gonna be key. Um, and sometimes that role could be much smaller and less significant than we might imagine. Um, so for example, when the Western media asks us as academics uh, you know, to speak uh, and analyze sort of what's happening on the ground, I think it's important to do the work to connect them to people on the ground who can provide a more kind of nuanced analysis and picture of what's happening. Um, I also remember as an example, um, members of the Movement for Black Lives asking what they could do to support young revolutionaries in Sudan. And the answer, um, they, they produced a solidarity statement, um, but the answer was, was actually, we don't want money. We need encrypted laptops and phones because the internet gets shut down and we need uh, you know, to get people to stop the US from interfering in Sudanese politics. And one of the ways of doing that is by amplifying their analysis, right? Um, in, in, any, in, in the context of spaces that we have access to. So I'll stop there. Thanks, Nasreen. Um, that was a lovely start. Um, I'll offer the next, the next question as well to all the panelists and feel free. Um, I don't know Sabine as well as others would like to discuss, but feel free to connect both of them um, because they are similar. And the, this question is, how do we lead and more significantly support an international Pan-African solidarity movement in the Horn that does not purport colonial nationalisms or empire in the region? Yeah, um, basically, I think I can only echo what Nisreen has said um, when it comes to um, proliferating certain perspectives that are more that are coming out of a regional analysis, rather than kind of stating our own positionality vis a vis what we feel that we have to do. Um, so that requires also an attentiveness to the things that are not so clear cut that are not uh, straightforward or coherent. And that is then especially important when we think about nationalities and, and forms of belonging and identities um, that are not so clear um, when you go to spaces such as in uh, Ethiopia, where I did my research, where um, this idea of ethnic federalism is not straightforward for many people. Like not everybody knows that they're, you know, Amhara or Tigray or Oromo or Kuna. It's just like, it's it's just not so easy. And, but people are being forced to kind of answer in certain categories. Uh, and I think one example here would be, uh, I also worked with uh, Eritreans that were born and raised in Addis. 
uh, were deported to Eritrea because they were deemed not to be proper Ethiopians uh, in 1998, uh, just before the border war. And then when they were in Eritrea, they also at the same time didn't feel uh, welcome in Eritrea. And so they kind of returned to Addis, um, what, which was their home. But now they had no Ethiopian nationality. Um, they were undocumented migrants, refugees, and really in precarious situations. So if you would ask them, where do you feel like, where do you belong? It's actually really complicated and, and it depends from context to context. Um, and also because there's so many experiences of exclusion and categorization that um, we really see sometimes on the ground that it's not so clear and that the reality is much more complex and that we also have to account for it. And sometimes I think what I get a little bit frustrated with is uh, when we have like these anti-imperialist kind of um, straightforward like uh, ideas about how certain things are ought to be um, or even within um, social justice movements is that there's some projection of what the reality would be on this specific place which does not really correspond to it. So I think we just sometimes have to take a beat and to understand that um, even though Ethiopia might work as this political imaginary of black empire, right, of blackness, but really it's doing re a lot of other different things. And so um, we have to account for what, what lives are on the ground that are not easy, that are not being labeled as Black Lives Matter, but like maybe in similar terms that have uh, their own local histories and groundings. Um, yeah, I, I think that's something that when we think about these connections, we really have to pay attention. I, it sounds very simple, <laughs> but I, I guess that's um, that would be a really important start to kind of account for it. And that really uh, speaks also to Eritrean movements that um, people that are Grow, that are growing up in the diaspora have a really clear understanding of being a retreat because that's how uh, most of us were born into the uh, into uh, were born into it but it's really different in Eritrea <laughs> um, and a lot of people don't see themselves so straightforward in these terms Thank you, thank you. That was a wonderful addition to Nasreen's response um, and the question that we had. Uh, did, if anyone doesn't have any last, does anyone have any closing thoughts on this question or comments? Okay, lovely. Um, well, then we'll go right into some audience questions, but before we do that, I'll pass it on to Sarah who will facilitate um, our Q&A. Um, but thank you for answering all of our questions. It was full of generative responses. Thank you so much. Can everyone hear me okay? Thank you so much. That was a very rich and um, yeah, it was very rich and gave us a lot to think about. So thank you. Um, so the way that we set up our Q&A was that um, we asked the questions in advance, actually. So um, I'm going to go right into them and the way um, I'm going to ask them is I, I, I won't direct it to anyone. I think anyone who feels called to answer it, please feel free. But what I do ask is that you keep it a bit brief because there were a lot of questions and I'm going to try to get through as many of them. Um, but uh, I do want to make sure that um, we do finish on time. So give me one moment. Okay. So um, and some of these questions are a bit more practical, some are a bit more broad. Um, I'm going to start off with the more kind of practical ones. Um, so someone asked, what are some advocacy tips, practices you recommend to the diaspora when advocating for people that are denied access to media or communication forums? So for example, air trans um, civilians, particularly civilians that have been cut off from the outside world. So I'll just repost that in our chat. Um, one second, yeah. So this is more for ways that the diaspora can engage um, that maybe you've seen or would recommend.
Can I go? Of course, thank you. All right. So uh, since the advent of uh, the internet, uh, one thing uh, that uh, the introduction of the internet has fundamentally changed uh, uh, political landscapes is uh, in ways that diasporas have become have been incorporated uh, into uh, homeland affairs, domestic politics. So this is what in uh, uh, sociology we call uh, transnational uh, uh, nationalism uh, or long distance long distance nationalism, where diasporas uh, can. Uh, uh, and of course do uh, engage in advocacy and uh, activistic work about uh, political and uh, uh, domestic affairs uh, in their home countries. So one thing one, one can do is uh, uh, organize uh, activism on the cyberspace. Uh, yeah, I think uh, this has been uh, proved successful, for instance, in advocacy work about the ongoing genocide in Tigray, uh, which has uh, been actually uh, what's uh, really very inspiring uh, was a movement led by uh, uh, women, uh, women in diaspora. Can I add a little, a little bit to that? Sure. Yes. Yes, please. So, um, in 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 uh, our interactions and in our discourse, I see um, it is mediated by by state, right? It's mediated by the established political forces. So, whenever you see people advocating for a certain political uh, project or for a certain political cause, you see it is um, a sort of filtered through uh, the propaganda, state propaganda or propaganda uh, projected by established, established political forces. So one, one of the main step, crucial steps that we can take is to craft an independent space, an independent discursive space, which is not necessarily you know, in the service of the state or in the service of uh, a particular uh, political force, but um, it should be grounded on our deep reading of what's going on in the ground, what's going on with the civilian population. And in um, um, Nasreen was uh, talking about given the people in the, in the, in the ground, like the um, uh, forefront or the uh, front seat to shape uh, their, their, to shape the discourse and to shape their activism. But that, that might not be uh, easy for places like Eritrea, where there is no even an iota of independent space where people can organize and articulate their, you know, uh, their calls and their, uh, their reality and their vision, uh, their vision for the future. So what we can do in the diaspora, I don't consider myself as part of the diaspora by the way, because I'm fresh of um, Eritrea, you know, I came from Eritrea in 2015, so I don't consider as part of this uh, amorphous uh, you know, uh, <laughs> entity called diaspora. But uh, what we can do is to first uh, really do our best to understand the situation and suspiciously keep our distance from state discourse or state-affiliated discourse and really establish um, uh, connection with the people inside the, our respective countries and that that could be you know the beginning of um, a more progressive um, uh, more progressive uh, interaction a more progressive solidarity a more progressive um, uh, political association so yeah I mean that 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 if uh, if that makes sense that would be a uh, very um, excellent step to take Thank you. Um, I'm going to move on to another question. Uh, so someone asked, how can diasporas engage with homeland in ways that strengthen working class and peasant communities back home um, instead of um, 
replicating capitalist agendas. So for example, diasporas investing in real estate that is actually harmful to indigenous and or residents. Um, so I'll, I'll post that again. Um, if also, if we want to pass on this question or need more time to think about it, that's totally okay. Um, I can move on to a different question. Um, hmm. Oh, okay. This is another really practical one. Um, so, um, are there any foundational readings on the conflict of the horn that you would suggest to um, audience members, foundational texts or resources or publications that is created by people um, in the Horn of Africa that you could suggest in learning some of these things a bit more? Maybe some of the foundational texts that have helped you with your work. Is it okay if I call on some people? <laughs> All right, um, Nusreen, can I start with you with your um, area of work of like what what texts or resources that you might um, that come to mind, or maybe even people who you think? Sure. Yeah. I. I mean, I have a. I actually think I compiled a list somewhere, so I can always you know, post it. But um, you know, I think that. Uh, like several historians, uh, Jot Maduk, Jot uh, Jok, um, uh, Ahmed Sikainga's work, um, uh, I, the the word the the book Slavery in Sudan, which was recently translated into uh, to uh, English uh, by Ibrahim Ibrahim Nugud. Um, I really rely in terms of news on Radio Dabanga, and I think for and it's in English, so that's also a place where people can kind of get up to date uh, non state uh, kind of uh, discourse on what's happening. Um, and there, there are many others, but I, I think, um, I guess I, I wanna sort of in, in responding to the previous question as well, I wanna say that some of this, I think part of why maybe some of us are stumped is that um, part of what I think is, is difficult is that, uh, is that we have to sort of assess our own connections to homeland, right? And sort of figure out, you know, um, where are where where have we built our own alliances and sort of connections and um, so when we go home, for example, if that is possible for some people that's not possible, obviously. What are the kinds of connections that we are cultivating? Um, and in in Sudan, it's also quite difficult to actually carve out independent spaces, but um, because we have a sort of history of trade unions and and, and uh, revolutions as well, um, people are fairly well organized and there are ways to plug in to that organizing. And so part of it is recognizing that there are already people on the ground who have been organizing for decades uh, to kind of put forth a future vision of Sudan that is more just and how to sort of, you know, support that. Um, so I'll start here. Um, I, I, can I call on Yusufin, um to share maybe some foundational text or resources for the work that you're doing? And if you want to answer, I think that's a really great point, Nisreen, about like reckoning with that question itself and how it could even be challenging to even engage. Yeah, I think it's, um, I'm actually uh, still thinking about Nisreen's answer because uh, I, I mean, at least for Sami and me, I think there is like a, maybe um, it's it's more difficult to think about investments into Eritrea because Eritrea, when we think about Eritrea, we can also think then about Ethiopia and what Abi has done in order to lure back all those uh, diaspora Ethiopians 
uh, when he gained power and, and, and kind of mobilized them in really state, uh, in, in, in the logics of the state uh, and, and, and in investing in infrastructure. In Eritrea, it's, um, it's actually quite complicated because if you invest in your homeland, which a, a large number of Eritreans have done, especially also after the independence in 1906 and up until the border war, a lot of Eritreans have fled the country, returned to Eritrea in order to invest. Um, and then, yeah, then after the border war that lasted from 1998 uh, to 2000, it was really more difficult to invest into the country um, if you didn't um, at least uh, do it to state um, form, formal way, formalized ways by the state. Uh, so if you invested in the country, that meant also that you're supporting the government uh, that is in place. And uh, a lot of, and it's not only people that are pro-government, it's really people that miss being at home <laughs> and uh, that want to have a home, they want to invest, they want, they want to kind of bring forward the country. Um, and so, but it becomes really fast political. Uh, one example is uh, that a lot of Eritreans that are living outside of Eritrea, those that have invested in building houses, right? Um, suddenly we're, ex we're experiencing the violence of this, the government when he, when uh, Isaias of Worki basically said that he's going to demolish all these houses um, and didn't even give any explanation for it. Um, I mean, he had some explanation, but they were just, um, they just couldn't do anything, right? Uh, and, and they were just um, at the mercy of, of uh, the president, so to say, and then they lost their houses. Another example is my uncle that returned to Eritrea after the independence because he wanted to kind of invest into the country and all his trucks were being taken uh, uh, in order to, to fight the border war. And he was of course never compensated. So that question to invest is always um, was always a privilege of those people that had entry and that could enter uh, the country. And that means that where they were implicitly um, allowing the state to do what it's doing or were supporting the, the state uh, in Eritrea. Um, yeah, and then I'm not sure what to say because I feel all these land issues as we have also heard from Nasreen are really also contested issues like who can own land um, and what is property in these countries um, and what's then the positionality of those people that live outside of these countries that they call them their home country and invest in them and profit from it. Um, yeah, so I think that's, it's just a question that takes a lot of time to answer and to kind of um, shed light on. Um, regarding readings, I think I can share some readings later on uh, and um, not sure if I can just like name a few but uh yeah <laughs> yeah, yeah off the top of, yeah it is it is um, hard to think off the top because of your every head. reading itself has its own thing so, <laughs> hmm. so yeah maybe things that are really crucial but then um it's also important to read them in conversation with other readings uh, yeah yeah like yeah what is even the foundational text <laughs> um <laughs> Does uh, Samuel or Alan Hayu, do you have um, do you want do you have anything to offer in response to what Nisreen and Sabine have shared? Uh, I only have one point, and that is to point to the difficulty, especially when it comes to Eritrea, to have an avenue of engagement with uh, with Eritrea, with Eritrean people, outside the state-sanctioned channels. You can only, in fact, in fact, it's only possible to go to Eritrea if you are government supporter, uh, if you are actively supportive of the government, if you are actively pay two percent tax uh, annually. Otherwise, if you don't do all this, it's impossible for someone, even an ordinary citizen, to even go back to to Eritrea. So it's very, uh, very difficult. Uh, it's an interesting question to think about. Uh, but uh, we have to appreciate also the difficulty, especially in case in the case of Eritrea, how it is almost impossible to have um, uh, a way to engage outside the state sanctioned channels and to be and to, to not only to engage but also to engage in a way which serves uh, the interest of uh, the Eritrean society, the poor, the downtrodden. It is it's really a difficult question. It is impenetrable uh, fortress, and uh, I don't know how uh, it, it is like a question that 
uh, Eritreans, especially those who are uh, fighting for justice, um, have to think about. But still, I don't see any 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 solution. So still a good question for uh, reflection. But I don't have a, a wisdom to share or an answer to give. No, I think I think that is the answer, and I think that is that is well, yeah what you said is the answer. Um, I. Um, Alimu, did you have? Did you want to add anything, or shall I move on to the next question? Uh, uh, I am not sure how far the scholarship uh, about transnational advocacy networks of human rights and democracy have moved since the path-breaking work by Keck and Sitting. Mm. Uh, I mean, it was like in 1998. So, I mean, that has been the standard work. Uh, I don't have any updates. I have updated update myself on the on the progress mm -hmm. that uh, in that front. Uh, but that still is relevant to our day uh, mm -hmm. in conditions of uh, authoritarian rules uh, or dictatorships like uh, Eritrea and Ethiopia. Uh, it was it is it's transnational. Uh, uh, I'm to a larger degree in Ethiopia, which work it. Uh, they work it uh, in a very bad way to the detriment of Ethiopia. I mean, uh, look at where we are now. Uh, we're supposed to be better off by getting rid of uh, by getting rid of uh, an authoritarian rule by EPA base. But uh, we are worse off now. Uh, it's, it's a civil war, uh, an ethnic a civil war that has taken an ethnic form. Uh, uh, the, of the kind that has never happened in Ethiopia before. Uh, it's not a war between uh, the military junta of Mengistu Ailo Mariam uh, against ethno national uh, liberation rebel groups. This is like a, people, a people's war mm, uh, fractured along uh, ethnic lines. Uh, so I think, I think at least in terms of effectiveness, efficacy, transnational advocacy of human, human, human rights has worked. But uh, the problem is that most of such advocacy is, uh, is uh, from behind, uh, is supported by uh, Western, uh, huge Western human rights watch, watch, watchdogs. So uh, I don't know uh, uh, how much or to what degree that advances uh, the cause of the peasants or uh, the workers uh, in any given yeah. country. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you for that final point, because it leads to um, the last question that I wanted to ask. And um, maybe uh, this, this is something that we can think about and it's hard to like answer in real concrete ways. But um, how can we push um, for international solidarity without encouraging destructive interventions by like Western powers? Um, is one of the questions that have been asked. Like how how do we engage? How, how can we engage? Um, how do we not um, feed into like harmful ideas or narratives, um, um, especially around like um, Western forces at play? Um, these are all really big questions. <laughs> so um, I, um, whatever comes to mind um, and is helpful, I think. Um, please. Okay, maybe I can just say something briefly. And uh, I think one of the problems that we see between Ethiopia and Eritrea in the current conflict is that uh, there's, and I only can speak for those two countries maybe more in detail, and maybe Nasreen can say something then regarding Sudan, if that's similar or not. Uh, but this investment in national identities um, that has been so strong uh, and this idea that self-determination is the only solution uh, in order to gain liberation and emancipation, right? And so we see even within Ethiopia, when it introduced the ethnic federal state, it actually had within this kind of formulation an almost genocidal logic, right? Because in order to be a citizen of the state, you had to have an ethnic identity. In order to claim citizenship, you had to be ethnic. 
or at least declare yourself ethnic. And you had actually also land attached to it. So there is this overly investment in land um, that we see not only with right wing or uh, autochon uh, movements, but actually also in indigenous kind of movements, right? That we always feel that when we de declare the land to those that it's proper to, um, then the solution, then we already have the solution. But it actually is always really complicated, right? And we see that with Palestine and Israel, but really also um, uh, playing out in Ethiopia and Eritrea. And this claim to land and as sovereignty as this way of liberation and emancipation that has been really an engine for Ethiopia as well as for Eritrea. And we see now, I mean, I'm not saying there's a tele tele uh, teleology uh, um, or the linear line that explains what ethnic federalism was and then how we understand now uh, the, the atrocities that we're witnessing in Tigray. But there is also, an, there, is, there are similarities or resonances of this kind of imbued um, uh, kernel um, within the ethnic federal system, yeah, in Ethiopia. But we also see that with the Eritrean liberation movement, that you know the claim for land sovereignty and independence was really always attached to land, and then those people that did not rec re acknowledge it or recognize it as such are often seen as betrayers uh, that have betrayed the country and that are not proper Eritreans. So uh, you see often those that have been excluded, they're not excluded because they have different opinions, but because they are betraying um, the determination, the self-determination or the revolution. Um, it's a very strong statement that I'm making, but um, I think in, in, in the face of the current events uh, uh, in Ethiopia and also Eritrea's involvement, it is, it's worth considering what we mean with land or why land is maybe not the only way of, of gaining emancipation and liberation. Thank you. Um, the question is posted in the chat if anyone wants to um, offer some brief words because we are gonna be wrapping up in about two minutes, so. Um, I mean, maybe I'll say something very brief, uh, and, unless somebody else wants to. Sorry, um, but I, I, um, I think this question of international solidarity also goes back to uh, sort of thinking about those entities in the world that are not maybe tied to the state and to this kind of nationalist project. And so, I think in in my work uh, about land rights. Um, and actually to what Sabine was just saying, I mean, it's, it's been actually quite discouraging to see, um, you know, you'll have these sort of uh, civil disobedience being used to say reclaim land from investors. And then um, the legal system uh, essentially uh, re redivides that land up uh, between people who claim that it was theirs, right? It was communal land before. And in the process uh, of, of titling, right, of giving people title to land, uh, there are some people who end up belonging and some people who don't. And a lot of that is based on uh, ethnicity. It's based on whether or not you are settled on the land, right? And so that excludes pastoralists, for example. Um, I looked at a case where it was about, you know, uh, who was buried under the ground, right? And, and what their people's relationship was to that. So, um, all that to say that I think there are, there's a group called the Via Campesina, which is a coalition of landless kind of uh, peasant movements, mostly based in Latin America, that is kind of trying to expand and to include more uh, social movements across the continent of Africa um, that are engaged in sort of reconceptualizing land rights um, in more inclusive ways. And, and I think to me, um, there are some exciting things that could potentially happen there where, where people sort of across the global south, perhaps, uh, you know, organized groups uh, uh, sort of um, link, if you will. Um, but I think this is a, a really, you know, it's, it's, an, it's an important but also very difficult uh, question. I think 
in the diaspora, oftentimes we talk about investment, like Sabine said, as this sort of panacea, as the answer to things. But I, I actually think that this is a total myth. I think, you know, investments are not the way to go. Um, I think we need to be thinking about um, investing in people, right, and in empowering people to um, form cooperatives. And, and, you know, especially because one of the things that seems to be in common in, in the Horn of Africa is that our, our, our countries, the majority of, of people in our countries rely on the land, on farming, on agriculture to make a living. So it is key, actually, that we figure this out because it's going to impact people in the long run, uh, it, you know, in, in significant ways. And, and investment in free trade is clearly not the way. So can I add something uh, before we wind up? Yeah, just maybe try to keep it to like a minute if possible. Thank you. Yeah. So, so what's driving uh, those bloody conflicts in the whole of Africa is the militarization uh, of the region, uh, of foreign powers establishing, you know, just scrambling to establish military bases, uh, whether it's in Djibouti, in Asap, Eritrea, or what have you. Uh, and the commercialization of the land. If you, for instance, take a look at the movement that brought to power Abiy Ahmed, uh, one aspect of which was was driven by uh, grievances over the expropriation of land and encroachment on the land of uh, the Oromo people uh, on the border between Addis and Oromia. So, of course, Addis itself is a federal city. Uh, it's located within the regional state of Oromia. So these two aspects are very important to highlight. That's, that's what I want to say. Thank you. Thank you so much for ending us on that note. Thank you all so much. Um, this conversation has been so wonderful and is leaving me with much to think about. Um, I'm going to hand it over to Paula to close us out. Uh, but again, deeply, deeply grateful uh, for you sharing uh, I don't know what time of the day it is, <laughs> where you are, um, but a part of today with us. Thank you. Yes, just to echo some of um, Sarah's thoughts, uh, Alan Mayu, Sabine, Samuel, Nasreen, um, and also Sophia, who couldn't make it today. We're deeply appreciative of the time and dedication to prepare responses. Um, and to our listeners and our audience to share this virtual space with us, um, to learn, listen, and ground. Um, I think it really ended up on a wonderful note talking about um, how there's so much similarities of uh, where we are in this, the region we're talking about, the Horn, and how these kind of people-to-people -people relationships and solidarities and struggles uh, need to be thought about and, and built and, and cultivated. So really, really um, thankful for that. And I'll just close by adding, um, this is kind of a remark only to our conversation, but we're currently uh, we have a campaign uh, where our last uh, magazine, which is called Free Dreams, all of the sales of the magazine were donating to an organization called Adamir, which is a Palestinian organization that works to support uh, Palestinian political prisoners held in Israeli and Palestinian prisons. Um, and yeah, we are currently donating all sales for Free Dreams magazines to them. Um, and you could like buy a kind of buy a copy. You could support Palestinian resistance, Adamir's work, and receive a print copy of a Black radical publication. Um, and yeah, all the funds go directly to Adamir, uh, which will help them provide free legal aid to political prisoners and advocacy towards uh, the end of torture and violations of Palestinian prisoners' rights. Um, you can just visit uh, 1919mag.com uh, to buy a copy and support them. But otherwise, uh, thank you to our panelists. I think that's it for me. Uh, it was wonderful. Take care. Take care. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. <laughs> Thank you, guys. It was so Thank worth you. it.